Today, as I mentioned, is our, uh, our communion service. It's, gonna, it's a little bit of an unusual service. I, I look forward to it uh, every time, and we'll have some bits of instruction uh, as we go along. I'd, I'd like to start, uh, before I get into the message, to explain why we're doing this and why we're taking the entire service uh, for it. Uh, communion, in its most basic explanation, is that we do it to remember Christ's death for us and to look forward to his return. Uh, this is a meal that bridges uh, the past into the future. It's it, We remember what has already happened and that because it's happened, what's coming next. Um, Jesus did not give us any specific instructions on how often to do this. See, the Bible simply says, as often as you do it, do it like this. And so... Um, Spokane Baptist Church for many years, uh, as often as we do it, um, has been uh, twice a year. Now, many Christians do it a, a lot more frequently than this. Some, some Christians do this every single Sunday, and I, I'm for that. Uh, many of our persecuted brothers and sisters uh, in particular, every time they get together, whether it's a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night, or if they gather for any reason, uh, they'll have communion when they get together. And, um, and I think that if you have to risk your life just to go to church, that that reminder that Jesus has already given his life for you is especially necessary. Um, for us, for here, and the day may come, I don't know, the day may come when we need to do communion more often. Those days may, they appear to be on the horizon. Historically, my burden has been that this not turn into a ritual. Uh, one of the dangers as, as pastors, one of the things that we have to balance is um, not letting things turn into just empty ritual at church. And I, and I think there's a danger in, in that where this is, a, this is a religious thing that we're about to do. It's, it's rich with symbolism. Uh, there's a specific order to it. There's a very, that we're going to read some very specific words and we're going to do the specific things in just the right order. And anytime you have things like that, there's a danger that it just turns into outward yeah. going through the motions. And it's because of a burden in my heart that this is too special to let it turn into just empty religion. And so for that reason, one of the ways that we have endeavored to make this as special as possible is through two things. One, by taking the entire service for it. We're not, we're not just going to do this at the end of the service. This will be the focus of our entire service today. And secondly, just by, by virtue of that, we can only do it occasionally. And so that means that it... Uh, hear my heart on this, if you will, I, I please. Our effort here is just to make this as special as we can. Okay. <clears throat> We've already read in our text, Matthew chapter 26. This is the last meal that Christ had with his disciples before his betrayal in the garden, before his trial and his eventual crucifixion. And it is the template for what we're going to do. Christians have literally been doing this for over 2,000 years now. You could go at any point in history, anywhere in the world, and you could say to a follower of Jesus Christ, Amen, or Hallelujah, or Maranatha, and they would know what you meant. It's the same across languages and across time. And this meal also, if you broke bread, and you poured... Uh, we're going to use grape juice this morning. Jesus, they used wine, of course. We're, we're using grape juice this morning just because we know that many of you... Um, do not drink alcohol at all, and for very good reason. Somebody just say amen. amen. So today we're going to be using grape juice, but it's the fruit of the vine. <clears throat> and if you broke bread and poured that, they would understand what we mean. This is a very special thing for the family of God. It's a very special thing for the church. Matthew 26 and verse 26, just look at it again with me if you would. I'm going to pray in just a moment, but let's look at these verses again. Matthew chapter 26 and verse number 26, it says that as they were eating, and, and this is <clears throat> not quite Passover. Sometimes Christians confuse this meal with the Passover meal, and it's not, it's not quite that. Passover is the following night. This is the night before. 
But they're, they're getting ready for it. They're, they're preparing for this. And uh, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and he blessed it and he broke it. He gave it to the disciples and he said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to him. And he said, drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many, for the remission of sins. We're going to talk about what it, Jesus meant when he said, this is my body, when he said, this is my blood. It's obviously not actually his body. He's sitting right there. It's obviously not his blood. It's still in his veins at this point. It's a picture. We'll talk about that more in a minute. But it's, uh, if you could put yourself into the mind of the disciples for a moment, it's this is all very alarming stuff. He's been trying to tell them about his crucifixion. He's been warning them that his death is coming. Um, but they, they just are kind of oblivious to it. I think they don't want to believe that it could really happen. But I want you to note why. Jesus said it's shed for, the, for many for the remission of sins. Remission is a wonderful, wonderful Bible word. It means pardon. It means release. It means forgiveness. Remission is, is a, it's, a, it's a total undoing of what was before. Sometimes we, we don't use this word much this way anymore. You might hear it. Somebody's had cancer or something like that. We might say, well, they're in remission. It means that the cancer has gone. They're back to how they're supposed to be. That's about as close as we get in, in modern English to this. But, but I want you to know that here in, in the Greek, it's very, very strong. It's pardon full and free. Not guilty anymore. Jesus says in verse 29, But I will not, but I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Jesus said, this is the last time we're going to do this. This is the last time we're going to do this. Until, until there's a table that you're invited to come sit at in the kingdom. He says, and then we'll do it together. That's why this, is a me this meal is, is a bridge from what was to what will be. Verse 3 says, when they sang a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is where the Garden of Gethsemane is. It's where Jesus is going to spend all night praying before the soldiers come with torches and betrayal. All right, let's pray here before we get into it. Father, we just bow our heads one last time, God, just to say uh, thank you for this day. Thank you for this table, for this, for this meal. Thank you for this opportunity to remember and to reflect. Save us from going through the motions. Help us to be genuinely engaged from the heart with you, with what this means. We ask this this morning by your power that you would do it. And we ask these things in the wonderful, the eternally great name of our Savior. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Pastor Jamie has gotten me a bottle of water. It's bad news when your pastor starts hydrating. <laughs> okay. If you'd like to follow along in your outline this morning, you've got a bulletin you should have on your way in, or we attach it to the newsletter if you want to print it and follow along from home. Um, we'll fill some of these blanks in. The title of the message this morning is uh, The Cost of Salvation. Today's uh, what we commonly call Palm Sunday. It's the Sunday uh, before Easter. It's the Sunday um, when Jesus rode triumphantly into Jerusalem. Things went real sideways from here. Today, we're going to remember, we're going to look forward to the crucifixion and what it cost. How much it cost to save you and me. We begin here, as we read in our text, with the Last Supper. We call this often the Last 
Supper. It's a meal that Christ instituted to help us remember. And uh, God is very interested in this. It's a, it's a, it's a very interesting thing how, um, how interested God is in food. How, how interested he is in, in meals. That's, we, we, we like to joke and tease about Baptists and blah, blah, blah. But, but this, is a, this is a Christian thing. Somebody say amen. The Christians, this is a Christian thing. God, uh, even with the children of Israel, before, before he delivered them out of slavery, after he delivered, before he delivered them out of hundreds of years of slavery and bondage in Egypt, the night before he did that, he said, I got a meal I want you to eat. And he gave them very specific instructions on what food to eat and how to prepare it, how to prepare the house even before they made the meal. I mean, it was a very specific meal. And he said, you're going to do this before I deliver you. And then you're going to do it after I deliver you to remember how I saved you with a mighty hand. And so there's a callback even to that in this meal that now Christ getting ready to deliver his people first gives us a meal. Exodus 12, you can read about the meal, the Passover meal for the Exodus. It shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you, what mean you by this service? That you shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians and he delivered our houses. And the people bowed their heads and worshiped. It's a meal to remind us of what God has done and um, Jesus is going to be sacrificed the next day of his own volition on an old rugged cross. And as the sun sets on Calvary, they're going to eat this Passover meal. So our meal here predates that by, by one evening. Luke twenty two nineteen, 19, we read this parallel account of the Last Supper. And it says that Jesus took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it unto them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of of me. Every time you take a bath, that's not a baptism. Every time you eat bread <laughs> or drink wine or the juice or any of that, it's not communion. <laughs> communion is when we gather the Lord's table specifically for this purpose and we do it in remembrance of him. This is a meal that Jesus asked us to partake of specifically to remember him. I, uh, it was a very moving thing. Um, we got to uh, go to Washington, D.C. And, and see, I just remember, even though I was younger at the time, being struck very sharply by the Vietnam Memorial. This is this long black slab with names in it. And, it's, and even as a young person, it's like hard to understand why I was so powerfully affected. You know, nobody's buried there. Like at Ar you go to Arlington and it's just row after row of the graves and it's very overwhelming, you know, but that's, those, you're at the graves. But, but, the, but the Vietnam Memorial was, it was this stark thing. And I, and I think it was because it was just this cry to remember, to not forget these people. And here we have, Jesus saying to us, remember me, don't forget. This meal is to help us to remember, but it's also a picture and a symbol. We do it not just to remember, although that's, I mean, that's why we do it, but the specific elements of this are, are not accidental. Um, we don't just pick anything we want to. We've chosen these things on purpose because the, the bread and the, and the cup represent something. They remind us of something very important. As I mentioned, it's not the actual body and blood of Christ. As they're having this meal, he has not shed his blood yet. As they share this meal, his body has not been broken yet. They are pictures of what is about to happen. The disciples clearly understood this. The Jews were strictly forbidden to consume blood. It was absolutely forbidden in the law of Moses for any Jew to consume blood of animals or for sure of people. Uh, Deuteronomy 12, 23, only be thou sure that thou eat not the blood for the blood is the life. Thou mayest not eat the life with the flesh. And the, the Jews to this day, very strict rules on making sure that all the blood has to be out of any meat before they can eat it. And there's 
uh, spiritual reasons for that and practical health reasons for that. I want you to know that if the disciples had thought Jesus was saying the cup was actually his blood, we would have read about their objections. Later, when God's sending Peter to the Gentiles, he makes him eat bugs, just bugs. And the bugs come down on a sheet and Peter says, I have never eaten anything unclean. I'm not going to start now. Now, if Peter was going to object as an angel gives him bugs to eat, Peter would have said something about blood. Somebody just say amen. amen. So they, they understood that Jesus here is not offering them his actual blood, that he's showing them a picture, that as the, as the cup is poured out, so his blood is going to be poured out. As he tears and breaks the bread, so his body is going to be torn and broken. The meal is a picture and a symbol. And the meal is mentioned already as a help, is to help us look forward. Jesus said, we'll do this again, but in the kingdom when we do it. Now Jesus, when he, after the resurrection, he spent time with his disciples. He, he spent 40 days with them and they ate fish together and they had meals together and they fellowshiped together and they walked and talked together and they went and preached and they did all these things, but they didn't do this because we're still waiting for this. The next time we do this, we are all of us going to do it together. Amen. And I think that's really wonderful. There are some, some dear saints, just people that I just adore, uh, members of this church and family members, my, my grandmother, who have who've died. They're, they're gone. And the next time I see them, it's going to be around this table. I mean, not this one. What's better? And significantly longer, I imagine. <laughs> We're going to sit down there with Pastor Tom and with Grandma and with Ella. and It's going to be good. And Peter and Paul and James. Wow. It's, but best of all, with Jesus. It's a meal to help us look forward. Revelation 19, 9 at the end of the book says, He said unto me, Write, Blessed are they that are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said, Saith unto me, These are the true and faithful sayings of God. Blessed are they that are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's, that's the marriage supper. We're going to sit down, and it's, a, it's, not, it's not this somber thing where Jesus is about to die. When we get there, it's going to be transformed, and all those that have been redeemed by the blood that he shed, set down at the great marriage feast of the Lamb. I mean, yeah. In the rest of chapter 26 in Matthew... I don't have time to go through all of it today. I'll tell you the story. I, I know it's familiar to many of you. But they, sung a, they sing a hymn and they go out to the Mount of Olives. They go on the Mount of Olives to a place there called the Garden of Gethsemane. From there, Jesus is going to be betrayed by one of the twelve, by Judas. Jesus is going to allow himself to be taken by the Roman soldiers. You read the story, they say, are you him? And he says, I am. And they all fall down. Jesus heals one of the Roman soldiers' ears that Peter cuts off. Jesus is not really taken by force. They come with force to take him, but he goes with them willingly. He's given a mockery of a trial in front of Pilate. He's sent to another show trial in front of Herod the king, who was in Jerusalem at that time for the feast, who sends him back to Pilate. Pilate tries, kind of, to set Jesus free. But the angry mob whipped into a frenzy by religious leaders that should have been pointing people to God, that should have been pointing people to the Messiah, are instead whipping the crowd into a frenzy to cry out for the Messiah's crucifixion. Pilate caves to the political pressure and he releases a murderer, Barabbas, instead of Christ. That catches us up to chapter 27. And verse 26, it's a couple pages over in your Bible, chapter, Matthew chapter 27 and verse 26, if you'll look at it there with me. It says, then he, then Pilate, released Barabbas unto them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he had him whipped and beaten. 
he delivered him to be crucified. And the soldiers, the governor took Jesus into the common hall and they gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers and they, they stripped him. They put on him a scarlet robe. They plaited a crown of thorns. They put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him. I mean, if you can just imagine. <laughs> they said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him. They took the reed. It's supposed to be like a king's scepter. They're making fun of him. They take his own scepter and hit him in the head with it. They took the reed and they smote him on the head. After they mocked him, they took the robe off of him. Now he's been beaten and whipped. I don't know if you've ever put cloth over open wounds and let it sit for a while and then tore it back off. But and they put his own dirty clothes back on him. And they led him away to crucify him. As they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, and they compelled him to bear his cross. We know from the other gospel accounts after the, the beatings that Jesus is too weak to carry the cross himself. And so they pull a man out of the crowd, Simon, and make him carry it. They come to a place called Golgotha. That is to say, the place of the skull. You can go visit Golgotha today. It does look a little bit like a skull. They gave him vinegar to drink, mingled with gall, myrrh, like the wise men brought him. When he tasted thereof, he would not drink. So they crucified him, and they parted his garments, casting lots. Jesus, the end of his ministry, the end of his life here, never owned a home, no possessions to speak of. The guards would divvy up the executed prisoner's belongings, but all Jesus has is the clothes off his back. So they roll dice to see who can get which parts of his clothes while he's hanging behind them, naked and dying. But all this was done that it might be fulfilled. It seems pretty bad. It seems pretty bad. But things are not out of control. The Bible reminds us that this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of by the prophets. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. As awful, as awful as this seems, this has not taken God by surprise. Hundreds of years before this happened, it was all written down by the prophets. And sitting down, they watched him there. They set up over his head his accusation written, this is Jesus the king of the Jews. Yeah, they were right. They're making fun of him. There were also two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand, another on the left. For us, we look back at this as the most significant day in history or second only to the resurrection. But to the Roman soldiers, it was Thursday execution day. They were just getting rid of the garbage. They that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads. They said, Thou that destroyest the temple and build it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from that cross. Likewise, the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and the elders, they said, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. It's one of the most awful sentences in the whole Bible. I will never, ever get over it. I mean, there's a couple of things going on here. One, they know that he saved others. They know that he healed the blind. They know that he healed the lame. They know that he cured the sick. They know that he relieved the demonically oppressed. They know that. And they are killing him anyway. He says he saved others, but himself he cannot save. And I want you to know the awful thing about this is that they're kind of right again. 
Jesus, they're wrong that he can't save himself. He, of course, can. Jesus could have called down 10,000 angels. It took one angel to wipe out all the firstborn in Egypt in one night. Jesus could have stabbed his fingers and had 10,000. Jesus said, told Peter that. He said, don't you know, put your sword away, Peter. He said, if I want swords, I got angels. He, of course, could have saved himself. But what they got right is they said, if he's going to save others, then he can't save himself. He's choosing to save them instead of himself. And they're mocking him for it. It says, if he be the king of Israel, let him come down now from the cross and we'll believe him. Liars. Liars. You know how I know that's a lie? How I know that's a lie? Because when he rose from the dead and the guards came and said, hey, the tomb's empty. An angel came and rolled away. Jesus walked out of the tomb. They said, here's some money. Shh. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now if you'll have him. For he said, I'm the son of God. The thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. From the sixth hour, there was darkness all over the land until the ninth hour. Noon to three. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice and he said, Eli, Eli, lama sin bentani. Which is to say, my God, my God. Why hast thou forsaken me? And the gold medalist for the worst sentence in the whole Bible. I don't understand it. To this day, I don't understand it. What does it mean? I don't know what it means. I can't, I can't get my head around it. Some of them, 47 that stood there and they heard it, they said, he's calling for Elias. It's in Aramaic, and they didn't all speak that. So he's calling for Elias, for Elijah. Straight away, one of them ran and they took a sponge and filled it with vinegar. They put it on a reed and they gave him vinegar to drink. And the rest said, let him be. Let us see if Elias will come and save him. And Jesus, when he cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And there on an old rugged cross between two thieves, the Prince of Glory, the King of Kings, Emmanuel, died. This morning we're considering the last sacrifice. The last one. The history of the Old Testament is, is a bloody one filled with sacrifices. Sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice. Starting with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden when they're first put out from the garden. The first thing to die in the whole universe is an animal that God kills in the place of Adam and Eve. They don't die that day, but an innocent animal did to clothe the nakedness of Adam and Eve. And from that day on, it is a long blood-soaked history of sacrifice after sacrifice, of death after death after death. Because wherever you find sin, you're going to find death. Until Jesus. Here he is. He's been betrayed. He's been abandoned. He's been unjustly condemned. He's been beaten. And he's been mocked. All of the very worst things that can happen to a human being have all on this day happened to Christ all together. There's nothing awful that can happen to you that you can think of that has not just now happened to Christ. And it's all subject of prophecy. Isaiah 53, 3, he is despised rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. The worst things that can happen have happened to the least deserving person. Which reminds us of the cost of crucifixion. Jesus did not just pay this cost in physical suffering. Crucifixion is 
where we get the Latin root for excruciating from. If you ever said something was excruciating, it's the same Latin root for crucifixion. It was designed to be a terrible, awful way to die. The Romans designed it to terrify their enemies. As we saw in our text, this is not something that was just for Jesus. This is how the Romans got rid of rebels and thieves and murderers. Generally, it took three days to kill somebody through crucifixion. You only died when you didn't have the strength to pull up on the nails anymore and get a breath. And you died by suffocation. The people that they beat and whipped first died faster because they got exhausted faster. But I want you to know this morning that Jesus did not just pay the cost for salvation in physical suffering. He paid for it in spiritual suffering. Isaiah 53 is in your outline. It says he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was on him, and with his stripes were healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus died so quickly on the cross, not because of the beatings and not because of the nails. Sin is what killed Jesus. My sin. I mean, yours too. But mine was enough to do it. Hebrews 9 reminds us that almost all things by the law are purged with blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. That remission that Jesus said, this cup, is my blood that shed for the remission of sins. The Bible's clear. Without shedding of blood, there cannot be remission. We've used our lives to transgress the law of God. Something has to die. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of the things that are in heaven be purified with these. But the heavenly things themselves with better things than these. In other words, the sacrifices in the temple, the blood sacrifices in the temple, were the patterns of the things in, heaven, in the heavenly places. The temple in Jerusalem was built on the pattern that God showed Moses in the cloud. It was a pattern of the heavenly temple. Not the real one, not the temple where God dwells in heaven. It was a pattern, you understand? And the, that temple had to be purified with the blood of animal sacrifices. But you could not purify the one in heaven with the blood of animals. It required a better sacrifice than that, the Bible says. It's the blood of Christ was required. Christ's blood never went into the temple in Jerusalem. But it did go into the temple in heaven. For Christ has not entered into the holy places that are made with hands, it says in Hebrews, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. The high priest went into the temple made with hands for the people. Christ has gone into the temple made without hands for his people. In a few moments, we're going to take communion, and I'm going to remind you that this is an observation for Christians. This is for those that are trusting Christ as their Savior. I, I very urgently want church to be a very welcoming place. We, we, we put a lot of effort and thought here into how, how we can make sure that church is, is a place where when you come here that you would feel very, very welcome. And so I do not like to do anything that would make somebody feel excluded. We, we are often thinking about what are we doing here that makes somebody that's new feel like they're an outsider, like they don't belong. And, and we, we actively fight against that. I, I, know that. I know that we fail at that sometimes. It's just things we take for granted about which door to use and where the bathrooms are and what do we mean by the connection building. And we have all this inside terminology, and I, I'm sorry. <laughs> We're doing everything we can to try to make you feel welcome here. But I'd like to say this as clearly as I can about this. This is kind of a family meal. 
It's sort of a family reunion thing. This is something that you have to be a Christian to participate in. But there's some great news about that. There's a seat at the table for you. You're invited. Jesus died on that cross so that he could adopt you into his family. If you're not sure that you've been born again into Jesus' family, I, I want to take a moment here and share very simply with you the gospel message. How you can be saved. How you can claim your seat at this table. The following communion service is just for Christians, but it's not in some exclusive club. This is a club I very much want you to be a part of. Please join this club. It's not really a club, but you understand. <laughs> when I share the gospel with somebody, oh, I forgot I had slides for these. When I share the gospel with somebody, I do it as simply as I can. There are four points. Sometimes the gospel, when I go through a gospel message, um, you have to start with, there is a God. Some people, you need to start there. This morning, I'd like to tell you there is a God. I'd also like to tell you that God is not like you've maybe heard or like maybe you've imagined. The Bible says that there's only one God. There are not many. There's just one. And he exists in three persons. That's not how math works. That is what the Bible tells us about God. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. When we think about this God, the gospel has four points to it. I'd like to share them with you simply. Many of you I know know this, but it's my heart that anyone here would be able to participate, and this is how you do it. You have to understand, number one, that we have all broken God's laws. We've all broken God's laws. In Romans 3.23, the Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It just doesn't leave any room for wiggle room at all. It's just everybody. Uh, Hugo and I, we finished the book of Acts. We're reading through the Bible um, at night and we finished the book of Acts and we're into Romans now and we're jumping some. And uh, so I've got Hugo, he's working on memorizing Romans 3.23. He's doing pretty good at memorizing it. And I said to him the other night when we, we were working on his memory verses and I said, do you think daddy has sinned? And he thought about it for a second. I think he was afraid to answer. <laughs> and so I just took the pressure off. I was like, yeah. Yeah, your daddy's a sinner. And he was like, yeah, I knew that. <laughs> and then he said, uh, what have you done wrong? And I thought, okay, time to edit. <laughs> and so I said, well, I've told lies. I've told lies. And he said, what lies have you told? <laughs> I was like, oh man, this conversation's getting worse and worse. And so I, I, I shared with him, I'm not going to tell you, but I told him, <laughs> I told him a couple of the lies that I, that I told, and he was appropriately shocked. And uh, I said, do you think mommy's ever lied? And he was like, no. <laughs> and I asked him if he'd ever done anything wrong. And he was like, Yeah. <laughs> I didn't ask him to confess to me what they were. But we just talked about how it's true, even for mommy. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans, or in, in 1 John 1, 8, the Bible says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Do you know who you cannot convince you're perfect? Anybody else. God, but nobody else either. You go try. You can't fool them. The only person you can fool into thinking you've never done anything wrong is you. So don't bother with that either. And that's bad news, but it gets worse. The second point of the gospel is that the just, the fair penalty for sin is death. And that's when people usually start to get upset. Like, oh no, like, you don't understand. Like, I know I've sinned, I've done things wrong, but I, I mean... But I haven't, like, sinned, sinned. And usually they mean, like, murder by that. I've never killed anybody. Well, first of all, whew.
But it's not just the penalty for murder. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. It's any kind of sin. You say, well, that seems extreme. Sin is extreme. Sin brings death everywhere it goes. Romans 5.12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. If you find death, you found sin. Or the consequences of it. Where Revelation 21.27 says, they're speaking about heaven, there shall no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie, Nothing's going into heaven that defiles, sin defiles. Nothing that is, has an abomination, that makes sense, or anything that's ever made a lie. Can I just ask you to consider this morning for a moment that if God let liars into heaven, if God let sinners into heaven, that heaven would very quickly become just like here? That's exactly what happened here. The reason we don't live in the Garden of Eden now is because God let sinners in. Now, everybody wants to go to heaven, except if God let us all go, we would wreck it. By my own admission, I'm a liar. I don't like to think of myself that way. But I've told lies, small ones, big ones. If God gives me what's fair, I will never make it to heaven. I cannot go. If you could secretly record everything I think during the course of a week, I mean like the thoughts in my head, and play them up on the big screen here, I don't think any of you would come to church here. I don't know if I would. <laughs> I'd for sure skip that Sunday. This, the suit, the tie, all of this, it's not the real me. Real me is selfish, greedy, lustful, prideful. I'm a bummer. I mean, there's good parts too, <laughs> just for the record. <laughs> And all the pretending doesn't help. We've all broken God's laws. And the justice for that, the fair penalty for it, is that you cannot go to heaven. We're going to die. And, and the physical death, the death of the body, is sad and heartbreaking, but it's not the worst of it. What I'm concerned about this morning is not primarily what's going to happen to your body. This body is also a bummer. My back hurts. And I don't, I used to be able to fall off a roof and be fine. And <laughs> if I sleep on my pillow wrong, I have a hard time getting up now. I don't, it's like, I'm not, yeah, I know. I'm not looking forward to it. <laughs> Listen, I'm not primarily concerned about what's going to happen to your body here this morning. And the Bible talks about that, but I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about this morning is what's going to happen to you, to you. Your body, just the tent that you live in. But the problem is that you're the one that's sinned. And so ditching your tent's not going to solve your problem. You are still the sinner. And you have to die. There's a place for that. The Bible calls it hell. And it calls it the lake of fire. You don't have to go there. Please don't. Please don't. But if God gave me what was fair, that's my home. He said, this isn't very good news so far. Here it is. Jesus paid that price for you. Because Jesus didn't just 
physically suffer on that cross. He went through the spiritual suffering of it. Because he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You and I never have to be forsaken by God. Amen. That which Jesus suffered, we do not have to suffer. Now, other Christians have been crucified. They crucified Peter. But Peter was not forsaken by God on his cross because Jesus paid that price. Romans 8, 8, God committeth his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Do you know that Jesus didn't die for the good people? Couldn't find any. No, not one. But there's good news. The good news is that Jesus said, you know what? For these, these sinners, I'll die for them. Before you ever thought to love him back, before you ever thought about doing anything for him, before you ever thought about serving him, Jesus said, I'll die for you. Galatians 3.13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it's written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. But I want you to know this morning that you have to personally accept this. God is not a puppet master, and you are not a robot. The Garden of Eden was not a prison. There was an exit door in the Garden of Eden, and it was called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The door out was always there. And you and I can get together and agree they should not have left. But you have the same choice. God will not force anyone into heaven. It's up to you if you want to bow your head and say, not my will, but thine. Or if you want to say, no, my will be done. You get to decide that. It's up to you. Do you want Jesus or do you want to handle it yourself? I know it can be embarrassing to admit that you cannot handle it. But you can't. But Jesus can. And he's willing to. Romans 10 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, if you'll believe the things the Bible says about Jesus Christ, that he's not just a good teacher, that he's not just a good man, that he's not just a prophet or a messenger of God, but that he was, as the Bible says, Emmanuel, God with us, in Christ, in whom all the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily. If you'll believe, with your, if you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Saved, 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 saved. I'm telling you, saved from sin, saved from death, saved from hell, saved from the judgment of God, saved from having God ever turn his back on you, saved all the way down. Jesus will save you if you'll have him. Jesus in John 3 said, Jesus answered, he said, Verily, verily, truly, truly, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus asked the obvious question, said unto him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus said, verily, verily, pay attention, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. When you willfully sin, your spirit comes under the condemnation of death right then. And you're still alive, but just the part of you that was born of flesh. But your spirit is under the condemnation of death. If you want to be alive, not just physically, if you want to be alive spiritually, Jesus says you need to be born again of the spirit this time. And then it concludes in John 3, 16 with the most famous verse in the Bible. And for good reason, it says this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This morning, I want you to know that you can have everlasting life, not because you're good or because you earned it or because you deserved it, but because God loves you. I'm going to invite uh, Tammy to come and sing here in just a moment. Um, sister, just be ready. I, I'm already out of time. <sighs> How you got blanks to fill in here. I'm going to fill them in for you real fast. And then Tammy's going to sing. And we're going to take communion before the children turn into a riot back in the children's ministry. <laughs>
I want you to know a couple things about my Jesus. Here it is. First of all, Jesus made an infinite payment for you. The payment that Jesus made was an infinite one because he is God. Jesus is not just any other man, he's God in the flesh. I don't understand it. You corner me after church, you say, explain that to me. I have no help for you. Other than it's what the Bible says. And if it were not true, I have no hope for you either. Because if Jesus was a guy at best, if he was a person like you and me, at best, that's a one-to-one -one trade. Yeah. And I sure hope it's me. No offense. <laughs> but that's not it. He made an infinite payment because he's God. The Bible says, in him, in Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. God was manifested in the flesh, the Bible says. Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus Christ is God. Secondly, he made a fitting payment because he became a man. Jesus Christ as the God-man, both parts are necessary. It's a mystery. I do not understand it, but I'm telling you the whole gospel depends on this. The whole heart of Christianity is right here, that God became a person. That's bonkers. But if it's not true, then you might as well just go eat, drink, and be merry. Good luck with that. But Christ became a person. He became a man. It is not possible the blood and bulls and goats should take away sins. So Jesus became a person. I don't understand it. In eternity, we're just going to marvel, I think, at this. It was a merciful payment because he died for sinners. He died for sinners. He died for you. He died for me. He made a complete payment. Jesus did not put a down payment on your salvation. It's not like we're playing some kind of a football game and Jesus is the quarterback and salvation is the football. And he like the quarterback throws this nice tight spiral and he hits you at the 20-yard line and you just got to get it 20 yards into the end zone for the touchdown. That's, I mean, that'd be pretty cool. I'll take Jesus as the quarterback, right? But you know what's even better? He won the whole game. It's over. There's, there's nothing left to do but get the pom-poms out and say, yay, Jesus. That's it. The game is over. He paid it all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. I'm telling you, he paid it all. He bowed his head. He said, it is finished. Jesus didn't get it started. He finished it. And he's ready to forgive. It's available. This payment is available to me. Jesus said, come, all you that are weary, all you that are heavy laden, you bow down with sin and guilt and shame. Come, water of life, forgiveness, pardon, full and free. Come and get it. All right, I asked Tammy she'd come and sing the power of the cross and then I'm gonna recover and we're gonna have communion. All right.